difficulty. I guess that's one good thing about the radio is you can't see it, but if you're like wondering what's going on. Good to go. All right. Well, I definitely appreciate this opportunity. I thank the Lord for it. Um, whew, I was telling Brother Dennis, I remember when I was uh, down outside of Pittsburgh at the near the end of my prison sentence, and uh, a guy was coming in Sundays to preach the Bible, teach the Bible, um, and then there was another guy doing a Bible study, and uh, I kind of thought in my heart, man, I bet you I could do a good job, and I think the Lord put it on that guy's heart to actually tell me to uh, come up and to do it, and let's just say I fell right on my face, so there's a, uh, I feel better now because I don't feel like this was my uh, intimate desire, so to speak. I think God definitely opened up the door and put it on Brother Dennis's heart. So I definitely appreciate the Lord, appreciate Dennis's opportunity. So what I'm going to be, I'm in the third book, which is called The Umbrella Fella. It's called Overcoming Sin Through the Power of In. Uh, so the whole premise, what I get from, I'm only in the first chapter, is about the preposition in. Uh, and there's different ways to say it, in the Lord, in Christ. So what I'm going to be doing um, tonight and any other time that uh, I get the opportunity is I'm going to be systematically kind of working through chapter one, through um, the rest of the book, whatever, whatever. again, if, if the Lord gives me another opportunity to do this. But that's what we're going to be looking at tonight. It will probably come off a little more as a teaching than preaching, but we'll see. You never know. I listened to a pastor online, and he was doing Sunday school, and he said, whoop, he's like, I'm supposed to be teaching. That sounds like preaching. I just had to get that out. So we'll see what happens. The point is the Word of God is going to be um, opened up, and we're going to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to, you know, hopefully the people will be edified, and that's my goal. So kind of for a text verse, which I don't really have one, but I feel a good appropriate one for RU would be Galatians 2.20. I've come to really appreciate that verse. That's one of the main verses. Actually, the first book is Nevertheless I Live, and that comes from that verse. So if you guys would turn into your turn your Bibles, and I'll try to turn in mind and remember where Galatians was. All right, so I'm going to read it. It says, the Holy Word of God says, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you personally so much. Lord, I, I know that you're real. I know the work that you did in my life. I know where you brought me from. And it's my deep desire as I stand up here and proclaim your goodness that everybody here in this audience and everybody that will listen tonight or listen at any other time that they would taste and see how gracious you are lord you've done a great work and i know that it was not by any means of my own power i wasn't even seeking to be changed but lord you did it you met me where i was at you changed me i was like that baby on the side of the road in the book of ezekiel that was full of blood and ready for death but lord you comforted me and you've challenged me You've uh, corrected me, and you've given me a new attitude towards life, and I just pray that uh, I can open up the Word of God, that I would honor you and glorify you, that anything I say would be uh, biblically true, and Lord, if I say anything wrong, please correct me, and may the people here uh, allow the Holy Spirit to work on their hearts, and may they be fed by your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so as I said earlier, this is going to be about the umbrella fellow overcoming sin through the power of in. So chapter one, the title of that chapter is the, and Brother Currington, you know, he's always clever on words. It's the defa ni, in definition of living in a preposition. So what is a preposition? This is going to sound like an English lecture at first, and you're probably going to be like, what is going on? But it's my desire to be as slow and methodical. I didn't even get through basically the first point of the whole chapter, and I got 
Um, we'll see how it comes out. I probably won't even get through it all um, because I got six front pages full of stuff. And I just said, you know, I'm not going to just blow through this and just kind of uh, whimsically give stuff out. I feel like I want to take it slow. I feel like it's, you know, the scripture says that it was needful that we be reminded of certain things. So sometimes I think we need to really chew on what's actually being said. So what is a preposition? Well, in English grammar, a preposition is a word that shows the relationship between a noun or a pronoun and the other words in a sentence. Prepositions are words like in and out, above and below, and to and from. They're, wor they're basically words we use all the time. We might not even know they're prepositions. Um, but this word, this preposition in, Brother, Brother Currington really seized upon, and he basically wrote the whole book of Umbrella Fella about it. So prepositions are one of the most basic parts of speech and are amongst the words that we use most when composing sentences. They're also a member of a closed word class. And what does that mean? It means it, it's a very rare for a new preposition to even enter the English language. So it's pretty much, they are what they are, they, they're, they're not gonna be added to. Um, there are only about a hundred of them in English, which I think is kind of funny, it's only a hundred, but I guess it depends on how many words are actually in the English language. So that's what a preposition is. So prepositions often refer to location, like under the table. So the under is the preposition. Direction, to the south. Or time, past midnight. They can also be used to convey other relationships. Agency, comparison, possession, purpose, or source. Now, of course, I like that word it says that they convey other relationships, which is pertinent to Christians because why did the Lord come? He came to seek and save that which was lost. What did he do? He came to serve and be a sacrifice for sin. So he came to, I love the scripture, it says God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. I mean, that's the ministry that we've been committed to. We are ministers of reconciliation. So I like that word relationship that kind of stood out when, uh, when I was reading that. As again, one might ask, why is this being discussed? You know, uh, if you've been to college, nobody wanted to take English 101 or English 102 where you wrote research papers. If you're in high school, it's like, you know, old school people would say grammar classes, but they don't call that anymore, uh, the writing classes. But however, I, I've come to appreciate in RU, uh, we have a lot of memorization, um, the Lord burned my heart to take the Webster's 1828. Sometimes I will use more modern uh, dictionaries as well. I like to underline certain words that I feel are kind of stand out to me in the definitions of, say, uh, appreciation or purity or forgiveness. And just looking up, even words you think you know the meaning of, because I don't know about you folks, I forget a lot. So just being reminded of what those words mean uh, I shared uh, a definition of demonstrate with Brother Dennis, and I remember him, he was just like, wow, well, say that again. You know, and in a rough sense, it had something that basically you, you put on a display that you bring the contrary to absolute absurdity. Uh, and we are to demonstrate in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're to demonstrate Christ. So we're to make people who reject Christ and reject the Bible to make their view to be absolutely like that is a ridiculous view, which we know that is something the sinner holds dear to their heart. I know I lived in that um, view for 32 years, but we do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, I was able to encourage Brother Dennis just by looking. At, so it's not only for you, because what's the Lord Jesus say? He says it's better to give than receive. And sometimes just by you learning and growing, which we ought to, because we're going to see that, that's kind of what we'll, what we'll mainly get to. And what I think Brother Currington's main desire was for Christians to grow, which that's what RU is. I mean, we often say it's a one-step program, which we want to see people get saved. It is a ministry to people outside the church, to hopefully people like the maniac at the Gadara, who would hopefully come in, see their need for Christ, get saved, and be clothed sitting in the right mind, ready to say, Lord, can I go with you? And he says, no, you go back to the people and tell them what great things the Lord has done. That's what God wants us to do. 
He wants to change us, transform us, and then send us back to either people who we've been around, which one of the prover- one of the um, uh, what's it parable? I'm reading a book on parables, and it's actually a parable that people don't think can be a saying, which was a prophet is not without honor except in his a prophet is not without honor except in his own country. Uh, that's actually a, a, a parable saying. Most people don't think of that as a parable, but um, why? Because people will often be rejected by people who know them the most. They'll be scorned, they'll be mocked, they'll be ridiculed. I know that my family often said that, you know, I had an uh, addiction to drugs and alcohol, but my mom said, uh, you're addicted to Jesus, which Dennis aptly told me, well, we're supposed to be addicted to the ministry. So, um, but people don't really understand. I often tell people at work, People don't really understand what biblical Christianity is. And I think probably there's some people who sit in these seats on Sundays that don't really understand what biblical Christianity I don't think enough people have really tasted and seen that the Lord is truly good, that he's really, he can hit you on the inside in a way and manifest that he's so real that nobody, you know, Paul said, I am persuaded that he is able um, to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. But that word persuaded, he was fully convinced that, that, that God was specifically to keep what he committed to him against that day. But I want us to be persuaded that God's real. I mean, he ought to just hit us. You know, the scriptures say that God desires truth in the inward parts. And that's what this program is hopefully, I believe why I'm a big fan of it, is it wants us to get to that point where we're just, we become enamored with God, that he becomes I used to say in prison, I want, Lord, I want you to be more real than the air I breathe. Most of us will, can tell there's oxygen in the air. We can't deny it. And we're convinced it's there because it's, it gives us life. Well, Christ is supposed to be our life. And it ought to affect our attitudes. It ought to affect how we deal with people. So that's kind of um, what this program's about. And again, looking up, so I kind of got off on a tangent there, but... Anyway, I was saying why, we, um, why we're talking about the specifics of prepositions. Well, you guys would probably say we're here, to wor- we're here to hear the word of God. And I would say, yes, you are. But I would say that I have, a, I have another desire. And my desire is that I have a goal, which would be to provoke you to be a thoughtful reader. And, and again, I wonder if we're just reading the Word of God as a religious exercise. Are we ever just really, and the reason I'm saying this is because the whole book is on the word in. It's a little preposition, it's a little two-letter word that we can gloss over. And some of the greatest connections I felt with the Lord is when I just hone in on a little word and God just opens it up. So uh, Dennis has said this, and I think it's true. It's not always about our quantity that we read. It's the quality. You know, we literally, and I said this in my testimony, God wants his word to come in and just do something in here, to stir us up. And it, we ought to literally feel like somebody plugged in, the word of God like plugged into our heart, and it starts doing a change. You know, it says being confident of this very thing. So we're to be confident that he, not us, didn't say that when I begun a good work, it says when he, that he which begun a good work will see it through to the day of Jesus Christ. And we have to remember, we're not the ones that work. It's God that works. That's another reason why I love RU, is, is it promotes yielding to God and letting him do the change, which is such an easy thing to say, but man, it is hard to just let go and let God do. We get in the heat of the moment, we get frustrated, we get aggravated, but this, this whole chapter in this book is, is talking about being in Christ, allowing, learning how to abide in him, which again is some really nice Christian cliche to say. It's very scriptural because it's words of the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry in John 15. But do we really know how to abide? Do I really know how to abide? And I think if we do, will allow the fruit of the Spirit. And tonight's principle kind of tied into that, which was, you know, if God's against it, so am I. We learned that fruit is 
is a result. It's an outcome. It's a bringing forth. It's called the fruit of spirit. This has been on my heart the last couple weeks. It's not the fruit of man. It's the fruit of the spirit. You know, we can look at this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such which is, there is no law. But this isn't what man produces. This is what God produces. And it only happens when we learn to yield. This right here, this is common ground. I was getting frustrated because I was trying to print out this, this message and I couldn't get the printer to work. And then when I couldn't get the printer, when I got the printer to work, the new ink cartridge didn't work. So I was like, I gotta bring my computer to work here. I was gonna have my laptop up here. But fortunately I emailed it and got it. So it's like, you know, little things. And I'm not always a, one to blame Satan because I think sin is the biggest enemy we have. And you know, I like what somebody told me in prison. It's like, I've met the enemy and the enemy is I. I think we give Satan too much credit for attacks. You know, I think that we're very good at sabotaging ourselves, which again is my desire that you'd be a thoughtful reader to think deeply on what is written in the Word of God and what's being said. You know, the Word of God is to minister to us. It's, it's that one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I was listening to a thing about the Passover today, and they were talking about the blood, you know, on the lentils and the doorposts, and it spoke, you know, it spoke to the families, but also another point, it was about the individual. God didn't tell Israel, herd up together and everybody, you know, sacrifice this, this, this lamb that's perfect without blemish, that's a male. He said, you individuals have to do it. And he encompassed the family because God's always been uh, a supporter of the family because he instituted it. But each individual family, and we can say every individual was responsible for going into that house so God deals with the individual on a personal basis. And that's what's great, is we can have a personal God because all the world's face, they don't have that. They're all works-based, and none of them have an intimate, personal relationship with the Lord, nor do they pretend to have. So that's something that's very unique to us. So we're to think deeply on what's being written and what's being said. And 1 Peter 2, verse... Um, well, let's turn there. Uh, turn to 1 Peter 2. We're going to look at verse 2 and 3. I can't be a hypocrite. I know I often think, uh, sometimes people preach, they just always read the verse and they never make people turn to it. And I was going to do the same thing myself. So. I'm going to determine in my heart to make you guys flip through the Bible tonight. That's one thing I, I like about Brother Dennis. So 1 Peter, verse 2, I mean, uh, chapter 2, verse 2, 3, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, why? That ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now again, I mean, I'm going to go through verses, but it's like there's so many sermons in, you, in, in every verse. But we're to be as newborn babes. I think of my son. I mean, he's two and a half, but he loves He's always like, milky, 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 I love milk. He tells daddy, I love milk. He desires milk because he wants, why? He wants the growth. He feels good. It keeps him healthy. It nourishes him. But God likens the word. And I know we are to mature and we are to move on to strong meat. I, I get that. But for the case in point, where it says, it says desire, the sincere. Why is it sincere? Probably because it can do a work that you can't. It's sincere. God always has our best interest. You know, God's not malicious. It says, if God be for us, who be against us? You know, who is it that brings accusations against the brethren? It's Satan. You know, we see that in the book of Revelation. You know, he's the accuser of the brethren. Um, you know, it's evil workers of iniquity who either through, through uh, unfettered sin or, you know, demonic oppression or possession, they bring railing accusations. But I say that, there's, as Brother Dennis said earlier, w there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. So God always has our best interest. And something we were um, cursory talking about in group is, you know, embracing the challenges that God brings into our lives. Why? You know, it says that our faith, uh, the, the fiery trial of our faith is more precious than gold. You know, it's probably precious, more precious than fine gold. You know, we've... We've been appointed to go through things. Why? Because God, God said that judgment starts at the house of God. And if it starts at the house of, the God, house of God, what does the unbeliever face? And that's why God wants to use us as examples, you know, 
and, and ha we need a little fear to obey God because he's put us on display. You know, we're a crown in his, in his um, we're a jewel in his crown, so to speak, and he wants to, to show the unbelievers, yes, I can bless, but I can also deal with my children. And, you know, if I'm dealing with my children, you know, I'm going to take care of the rest of you if you guys don't become my children. Not a lot of people like to hear that because there's a lot of uh, promoting that God's love, but he uh, chastens every son he receiveth. So our goal ought to be to gain insight and understanding in the holy word of God. Insight is a noun, which means it is a thing. So it's something that we can get. It's an object. And insight is defined as sight or view of the interior of anything. I like this. Deep inspection or view, introspection. So we're to, we're to deeply, you know, we're to desire the deep things of God. We're to, you know, it says in, in the book of Hebrews that the angels look into the things. You know, we often think that um, God only, angels and Satan only know what God allows them to know. We often think, and I've said it myself, that, oh, Satan knows the end of this. Do you know that if God blinded Satan's eyes to what's going to happen in the end, then he's, he's blind. Now, do we know that? We don't. You know, um, God is so powerful that he can give you the answer in front of your face and allow you not to see it. The proverb says that the seeing eye and the hearing ear, hearing ear both are made by the Lord. And he can, has he, has he not blinded Israel? He has. So that's, again, the fearful thing that, that God could blind us. But we need... We need to be churning into God and say, wow, you can give me insight. You can give me deep introspection into your word. And, you know, he says, seek me early. You know, we're to look into the word of God so we can be encouraged. Understanding can be used as a noun or an adjective. I like this verse in Proverbs 4, 7. Let's turn there. This is always one of my, I mean, I'll say it a lot that this is one of my favorite verses. In Proverbs 4, 7, the scripture emphatically tells us wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. So when we say, oh, I know understanding, but do you know what understanding? You know, I often think, like, what if somebody says, define that for me? Can I really give a textbook answer to what understanding is? Probably not. That's, again, why I, I often think of having a son, like, okay, daddy, what's that mean? Um, it means I understand. <laughs> that doesn't cut it. So I think we ought to, you know, take this time in our you and really, you know, use our dictionaries, use our meditation skills, and really dig deep, again, in the simple words that we think we know the meaning of. And I think a good test is, can I, what's the definition of that? Can, I de can we define it without using the word in the definition? That's a good test that we failed. So the understanding is comprehending... I like this, apprehending, which means to seize or take or conceive the ideas or sense of another or of a writing, learning, or being informed. So we're to, we're to grab hold, we're to seize the ideas or sense of another. Well, as Christians, whose ideas ought, ought we be, be apprehending? Whose ideas ought we to be seizing? Well, aren't they the Lord? Isn't it the lover of our soul? Isn't it the one who purchased us? Who I love the picture in the Greek, but I don't know Greek, but I've heard it explained well. It says that God went into the slave market and he put his mark on us and we can never be sold ever again. And we were brought out of the market and we are now on his, uh, uh, his purchased possession as the scriptures. Know ye not that you were bought with a price with the precious blood of Lord Jesus Christ? I just love that picture. I can just, I, I just visualize God going in and, and me standing up on a block and they used to sell slaves and people would go there and buy them and God just grabbing me and taking me. You know, the book of Hosea is a great picture of, of God repurchasing a bride. And it's just, that's, you know, when we think of scripture and we think of what God did for us, you know, it ought to stir our emotions. We ought to maybe weep. We ought to well up some tears. We ought to really be thankful for what God did for us. You know, something I, 
I try to think about as much as I can is, you know, where, where the Lord Jesus sent out, uh, I don't know if he sent out the 70 possibly, but they came back rejoicing. And th- what was their first thing they said? They said, even the spirits are subject to us. That's what they were all excited about. He said, no, you rejoice that your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That, I will tell you, is the single most important thing. If your name is in that book, which I did a, a, um, a, a quick little look on the um, uh, King James Version online, there, you can actually word search about how many times the word book comes in the scripture, you know, and it's amazing how many times God says, you know, talks about different books. But that's the book of all books, you know, because there were other books that are going to be opened in the great white throne judgment, which, you know, I hope everybody here has escaped. You know, I hope everybody here has saving faith. I hope everybody here is regenerated. And if you are, we ought to get excited that our name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I mean, that John wept in heaven when he was caught up there and because there was, a, there was a book that no man could open. And it said, he said, the angel said, don't, sh- don't cry, basically, because the lion of the tribe of Judah, he hath prevailed. And he went, and I believe he went to the Father on his throne, and he took that book, and he was able to open it. Now, there was judgments, but that's the kind of power. That's who, that's who we belong to, is somebody who did something that nobody else could do. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And, and, and when we read these things, they ought to do something to us. I was sharing this. Uh, I thought this was interesting. Um, in the book of Job, chapter 32, verse 6 through 9, it reads, And Eliahu, the son of uh, Bar- Barchel, the, the Buzzite, answered and said, I am young, and ye are very old. Wherefore, I was afraid and durst not show you mine opinion. I said, days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. I think, again, there's a lot in here. This, This young man had respect unto his elders, and he held his mouth, and he let the three friends of Job basically try to find an explanation of why Job was suffering, which they had no good answer. So he ended up giving his. But I like, he says, there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Again, God is the one that gives us understanding. The, the fact that I can even stand up here and say anything that I can say that anything that makes remotely sense is because God opened my eyes. You know, understanding, that's what we read. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all thy getting, get, under, get understanding. The understanding to me is, is, is the pinnacle of what we need. Because if I understand poison kills me, guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to take it. I can have wisdom and say, oh yeah, I know that... I know rat poison is going to kill me. Oh, that's the only part of it. Understanding curbs my behavior. It influences me. And when I really understand and get something at a heart level, it's actually going to affect my behavior. So therefore, I think that's why God says get understanding. Because I think a lot of us, myself included, we have knowledge, we have wisdom. But at the end of the day, what do we really need? Do I have to, how long do I have to Okay, do I have till 9.30? Okay, I, that's what I thought. And I, I, I don't want to head knowledge. I'll tell you a verse that a man, he was a lifer. Uh, he went to prison for murder when he was 21. He was about 50 or so. God blessed me. You know, he, he had that man give me a Strong's Concordance, a theological book. I mean, I knew nothing. You know, this man, you know, he was a, a wonderful Christian man. Um, but... He gave me one verse, you know, and it's uh, 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 8, or maybe 2nd, one of them. But it says, pertaining to food, meat offered unto idols, we have knowledge. But here's, the, here's, the, here's, the, here's what he wanted me to get. But knowledge puffeth up, but love edifies. 
He said, no matter how much knowledge you get, don't let it puff you up. It's love that edifies. Love builds people up. Love encourages. We give the truth in love, but at the end of the day, we can, we can, we can gain all this knowledge and all this wisdom, but what, 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 does it have an impact on our life? Does it affect our behavior? Like Dennis has said, even I think Pastor said, like they know people that have large portions of Scripture memorized, but does it, is there a change? And I like what he says at this end part, and this is no offense to anybody who's older. It says, great men are not always wise, neither do the aged understand judgment. And Dennis brought this up in his prayer request, which I love the Lord, because he just always ties things. He tied the principle. He tied things together. And that's my desire, is we need to be growing. And I grant it. I don't believe, I think we're either moving forward in our Christian life, or we're kind of retrograde motion. Like, but we need to grow. And I'm telling you, the world is changing faster than, you know, if any other time it happened, it was in Genesis 6. And, and, and Genesis between 5 and 6, uh, you know, right before the Great Rebellion, and uh, God had to basically judge the earth. Um, I mean, the world is changing so fast, so quickly. I mean, compared to when I grow up and what I see, you know, people, you know, they have their third arms and their cell phones, and nobody can be not connected to their devices. People don't know how to interact with people. People don't know how to make eye contact with people anymore social media, all this garbage that's really, I think, being used as vehicles for actually causing the love of many to wax colder and colder. Uh, not saying they're evil in themselves, but wicked men, you know, they're using them, and things are going to get worse because between augmented reality and mixed virtual reality, which is about to come out through five ge fifth generation technology phones, which they're already planning to have rolled out 50% of it. Um, the United States under 5G, which is, you can basically download 10 gigabytes in a second, uh, is coming to the United States because they're going to hit populated areas. People are going to be so much more immersed in these. And you know what? I heard this lady say that the goal of this is to escape the bounds of reality, the limitations of reality. Who... That is wicked thought. Who, we're going to escape the reality of the limitations of reality, and I don't want Christians getting sucked into that because that's what the world, they're going to wholesale buy this stuff, and we can become cold, and we are reading, as Brother Ben shared with us in uh, Revelation chapter 3, you know, uh, and, and Brother uh, Dennis brought out that, you know, we have a name, but thou art dead. We don't... We know what the scripture says. Many are going to grow cold. Many are going to depart from the faith. All these wicked, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But we as Christians, are we going to be found in those verses? I hope not. And my encouragement, and the reason I'm saying what I'm saying is to exhort you, to admonish you, know what the scripture says, think deeply, and say, I don't want to be in that. Now, you know, am I going to be reprobate and lose my salvation? No, but we can still grow cold. You know, one of the uh, definitions, I think it's compassion, is knowing that another person's hurt is affecting my heart. You know, it's so easy to become apathetic. It is, and I've succumbed to it. I've, I've, I, I wax and wane with apathy, and I say that as a, as a confession, and I'm, I don't, I'm not proud of it, but... I say this to encourage you guys, so then you guys will encourage me. You know, we, we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, which is such as the manner of some. The much more as we see, what's it say? It says, as we see the day approaching. Well, we're to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. We need to see what's happening. Scripture prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. We are seeing the infrastructure of the Antichrist system. We are seeing globalization and walls being broken. I mean, never such a time have we seen, um, it's been said before, it's true, how we can literally see how the Antichrist will arrive and be received. And of course, Jesus said, you know, he who comes in his own name, you shall receive. So we need to know these things because what do we need to do? We need to warn men from the wrath to come, you know. And the Word of God and a deep personal relationship will help us grow. 
Because we see desire the sincere milk or the word of, word of God that we may grow thereby. So how do we grow? We grow by the word of God. We grow by yielding to it. We grow by allowing it to do the work. Uh, in Job 38, 36, it says, this is God's rebuttal to Job. And again, showing that all things are of God. He says, who hath put wisdom in the inward parts? Or who hath given understanding to the heart? You've got to love the rhetorical questions of God, which in a general sense, um, I actually did look up the word I, for one of the messages I gave at the nursing home, but uh, basically a rhetorical question is, an, is a question that literally answers itself. So God is giving the explanation. He puts wisdom in the inward parts. He puts truth in the inward parts. He gives understanding. Why? That all things God may be exalted. And, you know, Paul quoted from uh, the book of Jeremiah. He says, you know, if we're to glory, we're to glory that we know God. That's the only thing we as Christians should glory in. You know, any gifts, any talents, we hear pastor rightly say, anything that you've received, you know, why do you boast as though you've not received it? You know, again, I can only stand up here and encourage you and, and challenge you to live for God and allow him to do work. Why? because he's opened my eyes to see that there's a great need. He's opened my eyes that, you know, this life is temporal, that is passing away, you know, that at the end of the day, it's about, you know, um, it says in Proverbs, a true witness delivers souls. You know, it's about giving the truth of God, allowing the word of God to regenerate men, them transforming them their lives and going out and doing and reciprocating in that sense, because that's what this is about. It's about God's glory. It's about sinners being saved. But if we're, you know, um, weak, you know, broken winged, apathetic, who cares, Christians, you know, it's not, that's not good. It's not going to cut it, you know, because one day we'll answer for that. But at the end of the day, we need to see that people need to see what real biblical Christianity is because Satan has so many counterfeits. So, Back to the word in. Why is it such a big deal? Well, God makes, he, spose, he chose to reveal himself through words. It says words are the vehicle of understanding. And I like the word, again, I said, well, yeah, let's, let's look at vehicle. What's a vehicle? It doesn't just have four wheels and gets us to the restaurant or gets us to the grocery store. A vehicle is that which is used as an instrument of conveyance Language is the vehicle which conveys ideas to others. Letters are the vehicles of communication. And I just can't help but think of Scripture. What is Scripture? <laughs> Scriptures are a bunch of letters that we call books that were written to communicate God's Word and God's revelation. Language is the vehicle which conveys ideas to others. Again, you know, there's lots of nice little worldly wisdom books that are nice to read, but what's the greatest idea? It's God's idea. What's God's view of sin? What's God's view of marriage? What's God's view of living life? How's God's view of, of raising our children? What's well, God of being, you know, be thou an example of the believer? What does God call me to be? You know, how does God say I ought to carry myself? You know, how do I be holy? How do I live by separation? All these things, these are ideas that God has in his word. So, as I thought that I would, I didn't get nearly through probably maybe one and a half pages, but anyway, <laughs> praise God. So I see my time is wrapping up. So I'm going to say this. I'm going to end on this. Our great God and Savior thought it well, and his plan was to communicate to us, his creatures, mankind, through words written in a book. That's 66 individual books that make up one book of holy writ, the infallible word of God. It's one story, 66 individual books. I love the word holy writ. I heard a preacher say that. It's like, that which is written. God's holy, it's separate, it's pure, it's undefiled. He's preserved it. We can trust it. It's our authority. And if you don't hold that view, you need to repent and you need to confess to God and you need to have that view because that's what God says to do. And we're to look at it and it's supposed to inspire us, challenge us, and ultimately change us. So that's why words are important. That's why um, I didn't get to this, but I'm going to end with, Proverbs 30 says, every word of God is pure. So what's that mean? In. In is pure. In conveys such, 
so much deepness that I didn't even touch yet. But I just encourage you, don't neglect the little words. Don't neglect the genealogies. I think God blesses those who read through genealogies and struggles to pronounce the name. That's the holy word of God. Those are pure. We don't skip over those. I know some people do, but I don't think you should. Um, that was my little uh, biblical diatribe. I'm telling you, you're going to be blessed. If those Hebrew words, God picked those words for a reason. And if you look them up, they all have certain meanings, and they're inspired. Um, one of my new favorite one, Hadassah, Esther. So if God, if you give me a, ch- a daughter, that's what I want to name her, but uh, I'll check with my wife if she's on board. <laughs> but thank you. Uh, I'm going to close in prayer and then um, just thank the Lord for this opportunity. Father, I thank you so much that I could stand up here. I take it not a light thing. I know that I really uh, respect the man of God who preaches from this pulpit, who you burdened to start this church, Grace of Calvary Baptist Church, and I just pray that you would continue this church and strengthen this church to have uh, be better and stronger in the latter end than in the beginning, Lord. Help us as individuals contribute to that purpose to be a gospel-preaching, soul-winning church. I pray that more people would come to RU. I pray that everyone was encouraged and challenged in their inner man to live more for you. Thank you for allowing me to grace uh, this pulpit. Um, I take it not as a light thing, and Lord, I just Help us. Help us all live for you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We want to thank Brian for that. So, you know, we do, we do tend to overlook the little words, and they, have, they can completely change, change things. I mean, there's uh, groups out there that will take, uh, uh, what is it, uh, and the word was God, and the word was our God. Yeah. Completely changes, completely changes things. So, um, you know, these things might not be important to you right now, but uh, at the latter end, they will be. You know, you're justified by your words and you're condemned by your words. And we need to remember that. And uh, that's why the scripture admonishes us to let our words be few. You know, the old adage, sometimes it's better not to say anything at all. You don't have nothing nice to say, you know. Um, but the word, uh, words convey, like, like, like Brother said, they convey a message. They convey ideas and thoughts. And the Bible talks about a, a word fitly spoken, like apples of gold, you know. Um, faithful are the wounds of a friend. You know those those words. They mean they mean something. And and to when you uh, when you put them together and you build build them, they they mean something. And they can, you know, they there is death and life in your words. In the power of the tongue, there's death and life. You know, I can, I can down someone all day long, that's death, or I can build them up with my words. So we need to be, we need to, those little words mean a lot. And, you know, we can be in our Bibles, but are our Bibles in us? So we're going to open up the altar just for, for a moment, if maybe... Maybe you never really considered those things. Um, and we're going to give you an opportunity. Maybe you're listening on the live stream or you're, you're listening on the radio. And uh, reading, uh, reading your Bible for meaning, looking for what you can, you can get out of it. Learning, uh, asking God to expose things in your life. Not, not to expose it to others, but to expose it to yourself so you can deal with it. And so God can deal with you as a child and not a, and not a bastard. I mean, you know, we don't want that. We don't want to be um, found not in the Word of God, right? Or in Christ. When we're in Christ, that's, that's a, a mark that we are we're born again. And the Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Those, that is important. 
It's the most important decision you'll ever make is to make a decision for Christ, accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's the reason he came. And God did that in Christ. He decided that in him. In him dwells the Godhead. And in him he should have re, uh, the preeminence as well. He should be first and foremost in our, in our lives. We're going to close in a word of prayer and we thank you for joining us tonight. And if you have questions about your salvation or if you have questions about our growing in Christ, write us. We'll be happy to, to correspond with you or join us on a Friday evening. Or better yet, join us this Easter on, on Sunday, Sunday morning uh, at our services. Uh, our Sunday school starts at, at uh, 10 a.m. and our regular service starts at 11. And we'd love to have you here. Let's bow forward prayer. Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for this, uh, this study on, on being in Christ. And Father, we don't want to be found out of Christ, but we want to be found in him. And as he's, he's in us, he can work in us and through us, and others can see him. And Father, help us not to, to hide uh, behind other things. Help us to not put our, our light in a bushel, but help, it, help us to, to, to live it before men, that the light will shine and will do its work. Father, we love you, and we thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen.